applause. Let's give him a big round of applause. My name is Phil Watts. My company is Watts Thermoelectric LLC. Um, 22 years ago, I met uh, Tom Fry, and we become good friends, talking and talking and talking and dreaming and picking out futurist trends. The one of the most interesting things along the line is they had a patent boot camp. When I went to that boot camp, I had zero patents and probably zero affinity. I go, duh, I need one of these things. Well, now we have our name on 19 of them. My first one was delivered at 6 p.m. tonight, authored by this man in the back, uh, Mr. Dave Boyd, who's going to speak next. He's the sharpest knife in the door. If you don't have his business card tonight, you're making a mistake not getting it. I'm going to tell you that. Um, well, a little bit about myself. I grew up in Wyoming. My father was an instrument engineer for Amoco Oil, and we grew up 100 miles from Old Faithful. And uh, we go up there a lot in nice, hot water, quiet. Of course, the whole thing could erupt any time, you know. It seemed very peaceful, very blissful, nice. Then my father would take me to these huge refineries. They're all shaking, the ground shaking. And the little sign says, breathing apparatus required beyond this point. And they always have these little wind things showing what direction the wind was blowing. My dad would say, hey, if you hear that bell, you run up in the direction of the incoming wind, you know. To see the comparison that all this money and all this vibration and craziness, and then you go up here to this hot water. So. Basically, from a guy hanging out on a farm in Wyoming, I'm up to my neck in hot water, and that's my company, Watts Thermoelectric. We store energy in water. 16 years ago, I was going through a process of farming what would be the best of the best of the best technologies to work with. And I found that there were just a few technologies out there, but they weren't the best yet. And I had to pick one to run with as I was laid off from my company <laughs> as an engineer, and I said, this is never gonna happen to me again. So I was working away trying to figure out something that I could do 16 years ago that would wind up in the uh, mainframe of today in demand, renewable energy. So along the way, I met another fellow, Mr. Ron Larson. I think he was Siri employee number two. I was there on the first day. What's that? I was there on the first day. He was there on the first day. He is Mr. Carbon Sequestration, and he brought to my attention that just how important getting this CO2 and carbon out of our lives really is. So put all that together, and that's who I am. Unfortunately, the accidental inventor is sitting here, my wife Denise. She's the accidental inventor here. In this process of looking at the best of the best technologies, we discovered that uh, in a heat exchanger, almost everything in the world is based on some type of exchange. Your car heater, your refrigerator, your home heating. And the first law of thermodynamics, your heat goes from the hot side to the cold side. And uh, if you're real lucky and select the right materials, the fact that one's hot and one's cold will generate a very, very small amount of electricity. Well, we ran into a character who uh, was proposing the Seebeck effect somewhere around 1820, that uh, these uh, two unlike materials would generate electricity when one was heated and one was cooled. Well, in the last 30 years, we found that uh, telluride bismuth doped in silicon, instead of making a very small current, it can be up to amps at around 12 volts. So, aha, there is the technology I need to look at because Wyoming has all this hot water and it's quiet. It's gonna blow up any time in an eruption, I suppose. <laughs> well, so when you're looking at the best of the best technologies, we're looking at solar thermal. Uh, another fellow I met at Lawrence Livermore Laboratories was telling me that on the roof of a home, of a 1,200 square foot home, on the latitude between San Francisco and Boston, every day there's about 13 gallons of gasoline energy equivalent on that roof. <laughs> Why don't we do something with it? And so that was rattling around about 70, 1976. And so I put that to use here. Well, I'm thinking, you know, we could generate some solar, hot water, put it in a battery. We could use a Seebeck effect. Oh, buried ground loops. At five feet below the earth, it rain, uh, almost 95% of the earth is about 55 degrees. 
except for Florida. Uh, it's quite warmer. But if you use a heat differential of that 55 minus and 140 on the hot side, we can generate a lot of electricity with this little thermoelectric generator right down here. And uh, be good to the earth. This is so effective that we can give energy to the village, renewable energy, without a carbon footprint. There are two words I was using in this day and age, 16 years ago, and hardly anybody at that time even noticed when you used them, zero emission. This device is a zero emission electrical generator, and it works in the dark. PV doesn't work in the day. And if you look at PV panels, if you put one into operation today, you'd have to run that for three years continually to pay off the carbon that was put in the air, making this sand turn into silicon. So here's a technology that bypasses that. My generator. Uh, my son-in-law called at 6 a.m. The patent for this thing just arrived to my home, Federal Express. I've been waiting for it for two days. I'm like a little kid with anticipation. This is my first patent. This patent was filed in 2004, and it took a tremendous amount of work by that fellow in the back of the room to get this through the patent office. And if you can imagine, we were talking about the difference between rectangular and rigid. Now, basically, they are very different. Patent office said, no, don't think so. Well, Dave convinced them after a long, huge battle, we've won. We use uh, the Seebeck effect, and we use uh, uh, modules. In this uh, picture you see there, there are 16 uh, dictionary-sized generators. And these generators are a step and repeat. Here's one of them. And these are very inexpensive. And when you look at it, being able to make energy at night out of hot water and cold water and not put anything into the environment kind of has a magical thing to it. Well, the details, the devil's always in those darn details. There's about a thousand microchannels of water all running in parallel without any instant instrumentation to maintain that. That is a very clever process that we were able to derive. And uh, this guy is ready to be manufactured. Um, this has been licensed to iPower. They're in the house tonight. Randy, you want to stand up? He's the man. He's raising money to manufacture these, so you might want to look him out too. Grid, poor energy storage. Well, it's like no energy storage. Right now in the AC world, there's, there's really no efficacious, inexpensive way to store energy on that grid. We can store energy in a cup of water and extract that energy anytime we want to make electricity. So, and with zero emission, there might be a planet left for your grandkids. <laughs> Old school batteries, if you look at PV and the technology why it's not so good, is uh, you store 100% of energy in that battery, but if you extract more than 20%, you damage that battery and it has to be replaced. So even though you have 100% of energy there, you can only use 20%. Who thought up this concept? It's crazy. Now, my water battery, we can use 100% of that water all day long, and that water never goes bad. How many is ha have you have had a bad battery in your life? Raise your hand. <laughs> How many of you have had a bad glass of water? One, <laughs> two, all right. All right, long story. I bet the details of the devil's in that one, too. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. This water battery is so unique. Think about it. You've got a lead-acid battery. It's toxic. You have to ship it somewhere, so you have to pay for that. And then you use it up, and you have to destroy it. Then you have to recover it. Well, my gosh, that's a lot of freight. How about use the water when you get to where you want to have electricity? And it doesn't have to be clean water. This can be very, very dirty water. Very significant. Best conductor. We found out our best conductor is water. Clean water. H2 has a problem. If you ever let your water sit around for a while and it gets a little slime in there? So we're thinking, well, we're going to have copious amounts of storage, maybe 10,000 gallons of storage uh, 
there's a home in Boulder that has 6,000, and he's been written up several times in our local information. When they filled their first tank, it was uh, 55 degrees, and by September it was 130 degrees. So solar heating of water is very efficacious and pretty simple. Well, the problem with that water, you have to do something to keep anything from growing in it. So that little nasty little slime uh, you want to eliminate. It grows on the surfaces of everything you can imagine and acts as an insulator. So in our generator with a thousand channels, we don't want anything in there. So we were looking at anti-slime. Well, that need of anti-slime pure water led us to non-toxic. You got chlorine, fluorine, bromine in your hot tubs. We come up with something that's non-toxic. So, buy slime, biocide. The biocide that we had been working on at my home, uh, I was testing it. It was a nightmare, <laughs> a real bad nightmare. I had a tank, a drum, if you will, small orifice, and I put my arm in there. I get this rash going crazy, and it was just killing me to get in there to get this thing every day. And quite frankly, I was skipping a day now and then because it was just uncomfortable. And my wife had a brilliant idea. This is Denise over here. Well, her idea, this is great. You've got to listen to your wives now. So, how many of you have wives if you're an inventor? All right. Well, then, so you know the problem. Sometimes she came up with this luxury biocide test facility. You got to hand it to them, you know. I mean, we <laughs> cold can of beer and we're happy. Well, anyway, uh, I was just talking to my wife today about a new fly spotter I've been working on. And you can tell when your wife's not on your product. She's really not there with you. It's little things. So she asked me, well, how many flies did you kill? And I says, well, I had three males and two females. She says, you're not an entomologist. How would you know that? I says, well, the males were on the keg of beer and the females were on the phone. <laughs> there it is. There's the Lexi biocide. We came up with this hot tub. Very clever idea. Uh, bless her heart. Uh, we used a very small collector. This is a very high-powered collector, unfortunately, but ours was just a little $15 uh, collector. And it was designed so that our hot tub would get maybe up to 100 degrees. We didn't want it too hot. I'm kind of, I, I kind of go for that bath water thing. And uh, this biocide we're using consists of silver and copper. You know who uses this? Anybody know? How, who's been to the Navy? Who's been to the moon? Ha ha, there's a guess. Well, peer pressure. My wife says, you expect me to get into that hot tub with this crazy thing you're cooking up? And I said, yeah. And she says, I'll tell you what, you swim in there for two weeks, and if nothing falls off, I'll think about it. The U.S. Navy, in 1940, they used this in all their water. You never hear of a, a U.S. warship ever docking because they're sick. You just don't hear of it. Uh, Skylab, Apollo, they all use silver. If you go to a bar and they pull out that little gun and they hit the little buttons for all the things, all those tubes in there are filled with uh, silver impregnated in the tubes, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, your cell phones, you just turn them off. Uh, they used to be all the chips in there, they used gold wires. Well, as it turns out, silver is a better thermal conductor than gold. They're all going to silver. Uh, so if you're, anybody here collect silver, silver coins? Uh, you heard what they're saying? Between now and December, silver's gonna spike. Three digits could go to over 100. It's been going up two day, $2 in the last two days. It was $30.99, where last week it was 28.40 or something like that. Well, silver's being used at such a rate that when you put them inside tubes, and they make some straws now with the silver in them uh, to kill anything that could be in there. Uh, when you throw that away, there goes your silver and you can't recover it. So silver's gonna go up. Um, it's been around for a long time. If you have a burn, it's probably some kind of a silver ointment use. Convincing your wife to get into that concoction, that's a different story. But she finally gave in. That little solar collector had a big surprise for us. <laughs> that. Uh, little hot tub, every night we'd come home, it'd be over 130 degrees. 
And that's the bell ringer. Aha, it shouldn't have been that hot. There's no way it could get that hot. Why is this so hot? All the test equipment we had, all the, the uh, uh, thermometers and digital stuff, are all, they're all perfect. It's 130, and plus it burns your finger off when you stick your finger in it. So here we are with the garden hose cooling this thing off so we can get in it. We're standing around in our bathing suits hoping it gets cool enough before it gets dark. Truly. And he did this every day for his whole summer. So we knew we were onto something, but we didn't have time to investigate the, uh, why it was getting hot. We just, it's getting hot. Well, seven years later, blank slide, intentionally blank. <laughs> I love that. We, uh, I woke up in the morning about 3 a.m. and I thought, you know, I need to come up with a regular test. And the test I dreamed up was regular water with ice cubes and our biocide with ice cubes. And I got ready and I said, you know, Eureka, whoops, never we're missing a slide. I had to start a pump to pump water through these ice cubes and water through the ice cubes in the, in the biocide. I hit the pump, reached over, documented the time in the lab book, reached over to unzip my leatherette case and my camera, got the viewfinder up where I take a picture. The ice cubes are gone already. They had disappeared in seconds. And I knew right then and there, this is hot. I didn't know how hot, but I knew it was hot. So, Eureka, we got something really hot. The good news about this thing, uh, besides being a superconductor, we had to try to figure out what it is. So, if you're a chemist or advanced crazy guys, you probably know that the Tyndall effect with a laser allows you to see the particles in solution. The A on the right is just plain Longmont water. The B is our silver and copper biocide turned superconductor. And there's the story. So further testing. The discovery is my wife and I flew down to University of Austin in Texas and we met with uh, the Weber group down there. And they told us, well, Phil, it's a two to three trillion dollar a year business and there's no solution. And there's no economically cheap solution. So the superconductor that's non-toxic sustainable, turns out to be a performance doubler. The performance doubler, not oh, safe, you can drink it, I guess, is very inexpensive. We can make maybe 100 gallons for 10 cents. Uh, we're actually, with the voltage, the, the energy doubler in this generator, if we use plain water, it puts out 12 volts. We use our nanofluid, it puts out 24 volts. So if we want to go to 12 volts, Instead of farming electricity at 140 degrees, we're now farming electricity out of 103 degrees Fahrenheit. We can take the heat off your driveway, the heat off your stairs, you name it. Waste heat, the low quality waste heat in bread ovens, bakeries, we can convert to electricity. What, a, what an advancement, this is huge. Right now, when we run the nanofluid through this, we're 10 cents cheaper than solar PV per watt. That's a breakthrough. The man you want to talk to is right there, Mr. Randy Davis with Light Power. Patton came in tonight at 6 p.m. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> My wife says, cha-ching. Now what? How do you get something like this out in the world? That's the big problem. So when we're looking at applications, the uh, energy storage is a huge one. There is no solution for that, and that's going to become very, very important. Uh, probably last month you all heard about uh, India having 360 million people without electricity or air conditioning. Well, air conditioning is <laughs> one of the first products. This is my backyard. This is my wood-fired pizza oven. These are my Terra Preta grapes. Terra Preta grows 800 times better than any other bested upon fertilizer. That's one plan is taking over the whole yard, it's like a jungle. Well, we have a uh, trench in the backyard and we put this pipe in it, we run our nanofluid through it, and we are conditioned my little lab back there on the left uh, for pennies. And what's interesting, once you put that in, you don't have a reoccurring bill. You know, a few pennies a month to run this thing. And if you run off a solar panel, you don't even pay anything other than the cost of the panel. Um, we can use solar energy to heat that uh, hot water battery if you want. If you want to do a larger envelope, maybe a building, commercial building, 
uh, heat your home for pennies. Off grid, on grid. 12 watts to run a little pump to give you air conditioning is pretty phenomenal. 12 watts to heat your home. It is a huge, huge carbon reduction concept. Uh, right now they're saying that uh, air conditioning on the US grid in the summer months is $56 billion an hour. One out of five units on the grid is earmarked for air conditioning. Just imagine all those coal plants out there humming away and making all this noise vibrating the earth, putting carbon in the air, killing our atmosphere. <coughs> We can change the world here. Plus, this is so inexpensive, we can give energy security to third world countries at a very modest price. If you keep the temperature of this thing at below 245 degrees Fahrenheit, this will last for 50 years. So it's a, it's a changer. Uh, that little night light in your kid's bedroom, that's about what it takes. It's a big, big change. There's a, a life quality will change all around the globe. You can be part of that. You know, regular AC is 20,000 times less efficient. Ditch those babies and talk to the guys here from iPower. They've licensed the technology and uh, they're gonna need lots of help to bring this to the world. They need engineers, bankers, private investors. Gotta help the world here. Well, accidental inventing. Had it been not for my wife to say, let's do this hot tub, we never would have noticed it. So there's things in your brain that there's a hierarchy here of water, of large volume, a technology, a Seebeck effect with a Telluride bismuth doped semiconductor. At the time when we were doing this, those things were $240 a piece. A friend of mine that had a surplus electronics business in California called me up one day and he says, hey, you got any extra money? We can buy out a company went bankrupt and I can get you these chips for 25 cents a piece. So we did. And we built 52 of these. Tremendously low cost. Today, those chips, you could probably buy them for about $9. And if you were to invest a quarter of a million dollars, you could get them down to one purchase order at that uh, scale rate you bring those chips down about 25 cents. So it brings it to a, a, a commodity that the world can use. Uh, but accidental inventing is why we're here. The really key thing is you have to have all of this technology running around in your brain. You have to have solar, what's good about it, what's bad about it, water, how do you keep it clean, ground loops, let alone the generator. And then the hierarchy of a home environment which spawned yet another patent. We have a hierarchical whole home environment where the exiting water that exits out of our thermoelectric generator, make electricity, goes into a separate tank and it's sitting out there at uh, 82 degrees, just perfect for hydronic floor heating. And then it goes back into a cold water tank. So we have a whole system of um, water storage that looks like flashlight cells in a big long flashlight. So all of this stuff is running around in your head and so when you have your umbrella built, perched above your head when something comes up, you may or may not recognize something. Had my wife not said, let's do a hot tub that got up to 130 degrees, like I'm expecting maybe 98 or 100, how can this be? You had to have that shocking thing that says, this isn't right. Mother Nature opens that little box and says, reach in, you can only have one secret at a time. She doesn't tell you what it is. And you don't even know what it is until you get it, then you may not recognize it. So it, that's kind of the, I think, the accidental inventing. There are things in your head that you bring to you. So as you think about things, they just keep coming to you. Good thoughts are the only thing to have. Well, here's another one that came out of that. Uninterruptible comfort. If the grid's gonna go down for 360 million people in India, I think I should be calling those guys right now and say, hey, <laughs> <laughs> we have a product that'll obliterate the misery you're having. Imagine air-conditioned hospitals all over the planet that have never had air conditioning. We can have it for virtually nothing. And once they start it, they will sequester all this carbon. They won't be building these power plants and nuclear power plants and nuclear power plants in Japan that have nuclear stuff 
in California. Know, by the way, have you noticed that all the Navy ships are off the coast of California sequestering all that radioactive stuff and sinking it? Yeah. Don't have that problem with water batteries. <coughs> Current grid. When that sun gets hot, your grid goes away. It's going to be our problem very soon. Uh, China's power is going to double in 2015, India's 2016, ours triples in 2020, ours triples in 2020. Ground air conditioning, migrating all those loads will probably give you your comfort, independence, and you'll save some money. 12 watts, a little tiny motor, that little tiny thing giving you comfort. It's an amazing step forward versus that big old machine you're grinding away, making all that noise, your power meter's going around circles. You could probably fan yourself with that power meter. Uh, your carbon footprint, the best thing ever. We can make a difference. This is our future. We were there, we are here now. Well. Thanks for coming to hear my life's work. Couldn't have done it without a woman. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Thanks, Phil, for uh, telling us the story. It's fun to hear it all laid out like that. Uh, I'm David Boyd, uh, attorney in uh, the medical and mechanical devices group at Kilpatrick Townsend, which is a nationwide law firm, uh, worldwide now. Uh, and the topic tonight is accidental inventions, so I googled a few. I'm sure you, some of you probably did that when, uh, when you saw the topic for tonight. And there are some pretty famous accidental inventions. Uh, probably the, the most well-known is penicillin. Uh, invented by Alexander Fleming in 1928. The story of this one was he went off on vacation. He's uh, uh, working in a lab with uh, some cell cultures and um, left some on his bench when he left for vacation, left them uncovered, got back, and noticed that some mold had been growing in some of the dishes, but some of the bacteria would not grow up to the mold. So, well, why is that? And that was the spark that led him to figure out there was something in the mold that kept the bacteria from growing. And that eventually became penicillin, one of the most uh, successful drugs of all time, still in wide use. Um, probably can't tell from the picture what this is. Uh, masonite was an accidental invention. You've probably seen this product in the hardware store. Uh, it's kind of a brown hard board. Um, if you have a workshop, if you have a pegboard, probably made out of masonite. Uh, this was invented by William Mason in the 1920s. What he was trying to do was figure out a way to recycle manufacturing scrap, you know, sawdust and wood chips, and make insulation out of it. And he would put it in a, a heated press for different amounts of time and see what came out. And uh, accidentally one day he went off to lunch and left the press running, not realizing that he had done that. And when he got back, opened it up, here was this hard board that uh, wound up being a very successful product for, uh, is still in use today. Uh, one I want to talk about in a little more detail, uh, vulcanized rubber. Uh, this was uh, hit on by Charles Goodyear in 1839. Now, natural rubber is harvested from trees, uh, originally discovered in Brazil. There are some other plants that, that have the, the latex in them, but, but rubber trees are the big one. But rubber, natural rubber is really not a very good material. It's very brittle when it gets cold. Uh, it gets sticky and kind of melts when it gets hot. But even despite that, in the 1830s, there was what they called a rubber fever. Uh, people got all excited about this material that even though it had been discovered many years before and brought from Brazil, uh, just kind of caught on and became a fad for a few years. Um, they were gonna make everything out of it. You can make shoes and furniture and just anything you could think of. Uh, companies got founded, vast amounts of money got invested, uh, products were made, and then pretty soon people figured out the products weren't very good. The rubber boots would melt in the summertime. Uh, about the only thing that really came out of it was uh, coating cloth to make uh, rubber raincoats and that kind of thing. But uh, Goodyear was 
sort of intrigued by rubber. In fact, his first invention uh, relating to this, he was in town, looked at a, an inflatable vest, uh, and, and thought the valve, the air valve, was very poor. So he went home and designed a better valve, came back, showed the merchants, I've got a better idea for this valve. And the merchant said, well, that's nice, but we can't sell these rubber products because they're bad. So, but he did work on rubber uh, for many years, tried many different things, tried mixing powders with it um, so that it wouldn't get sticky when it got hot, um, tried mixing it with nitric acid and just a, a lot of different things. He did manage to improve rubber a little bit, but didn't really get there until uh, a day in 1839. He just, uh, and there, there are different stories about how this happened, but uh, he had a mixture of rubber and sulfur that somehow, apparently accidentally, got dropped on a hot stove. And instead of melting, it charred. It behaved differently than what he had been used to seeing with rubber products. And not only that, um, at some point between the hot stove and the part that had not been on the hot stove, there was a little layer of something that was a really nice material. So the next challenge was to figure out, well, how do you do this on purpose? How do you make the entire product uh, behave like that? And uh, eventually hit on the recipe uh, and became the inventor of vulcanized rubber, a very important uh, invention. So this is the philosophical slide. Uh, uh, Pasteur said once that chance favors the prepared mind. And even Goodyear uh, sort of dismissed the idea that his invention was accidental. You know, after all, he had worked toward it for a long, long time. Uh, he said he was the, the person most likely to have recognized this when it happened. So um, you can debate, uh, is there such thing as an accident? But that's a little beyond the scope of what we want to talk about tonight. Uh, the story is a little bit cautionary uh, as well as a little bit inspirational. Uh, Goodyear did not profit very handsomely from his invention. He was not a very good businessman. He did get several patents. He did enforce his patents, won several patent suits, but uh, was not very good about the licensing of them and uh, missed out on some, some deals uh, and actually uh, died way in debt even in, in uh, that time. Now, the royalties eventually did provide pretty well for his family, so that, that, that uh, turned out. Uh, he's not connected with the Goodyear Company, by the way. Uh, his name is, but he was never, never associated with, with the Goodyear Company. So that's the, uh, the story of uh, vulcanized rubber. And I want to talk a little bit about the patent process. Uh, so who knows what a patent is? How, how would you summarize what a patent is? Anybody want to take a shot? <laughs> Go ahead. Temporary monopoly granted by the government for a conviction. Hmm? With the uh, requirement that you then educate the world on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got some experts back here. That's almost exactly how I explained it. A right to exclude. <laughs> Tem temporary limited monopoly in exchange for disclosure of your invention. And if you think about why, why are there patent laws? Why would, a, why would a country have a patent law? It's not just to be nice to inventors. Uh, it's to get this disclosure. It's in the, in the interest of the country to have new discoveries publicized so that other inventors can build on them. And even though monopolies are generally pretty frowned upon in the U.S., a patent is an exception. It's a, a temporary right the government will grant you uh, in exchange for explaining to other people how to make and use your invention. Um, uh, it's a type of what we call intellectual property. And I underline the word property because it's such a good analogy. You can think of it in, in many ways the same as you would think of owning a piece of land, a piece of property. You know, with land, you build a fence around it, and you have the right, because you're the owner of the land, to keep other people from crossing it. Uh, in the same way, because you own the patent, you have the right, you build a fence around your invention with this patent, you have the right to prevent other people from practicing that invention. But just like with land, owning the land does not bring you an income. In fact, it probably costs you money because you probably have to pay property taxes on it. Uh, in order to derive value from that land, you have to do something with it. You could grow a crop on it, 
You could, if it's between two things people want to go between, you could charge people for walking across it. You could lease out the land so that somebody else could, to, could use it productively. And there are analogous ways you can use a patent. Just owning the patent um, doesn't instantly bring you any kind of income. But you could license the patent, you could sell the patent, you could uh, enforce it by uh, requiring that somebody pay you for the right to produce what you've patented. Uh, very analogous to property. Uh, we talk about what kinds of things can be patented. There are three basic requirements. First, an invention has to be useful. Now, uh, almost everything is useful enough to qualify for patentability, although there is a lot of interesting case law about that. Uh, for our purposes, almost everything's useful. Uh, has to be novel, and novel just means it's different than any one thing that's out there. Uh, the patent office, when they look at your patent application, can't find a single device or published reference that describes your invention exactly as it is. Uh, and then the third requirement is that it be non-obvious. So even if your invention is novel, even if it's something new that nobody's ever made before, uh, it still may not qualify for a patent if it's obvious. And this is mostly what patent attorneys do, is argue with the patent office about what it means to be obvious or not. Um, uh, the test is, is pretty technical. Uh, usually it can be overcome, but basically what it means is in order to reject your patent application, the patent office has to show that the parts of your invention existed and there would have been some reason somebody would have put them together. So those are the three requirements. I put them all on one slide together just to emphasize the point. It's all three, you have to do all three, not just one of the above, but you have to have all three of the above. Uh, there are several different kinds of patent applications. Some of you have probably heard of a provisional patent application. Uh, uh, this is uh, basically reserves your place in line. You file a description of your invention with the patent office. Uh, it sits there, nobody's going to look at it, but it gives you the right within the next year to file a regular uh, utility or non-provisional patent application. And this is what most people think of as an actual patent application. It describes your invention, part of the disclosure that's required. Um, it has claims that very specifically line out, this is what I think I invented. Uh, it probably has several figures and drawings of the invention. And that will be looked at by an examiner at some point, and we'll talk a little more about that process. Uh, there's also something called a design patent. Uh, these have been in the news lately because some of the patents involved in the uh, suit between Samsung and Apple were design patents. Uh, design patents don't necessarily uh, patent machines or the, the working of them, they, they, they patent the look of something. And a good example for a design patent is the ceiling fans. You know, a ceiling fan is basically a motor with some blades on it. Uh, but it's important to the people selling the ceiling fan that their fans look distinctive. You know, maybe they have blades that look like palm leaves or something like that. Uh, they put some time into developing that, tooling it, figuring out how to make that shape. Uh, they don't want somebody just copying their design and riding on their reputation and their uh, groundwork to come up with that design. So that's where a design patent is useful. It covers the look of something. Uh, they call it the... Um, uh, the ornamentality requirement, the ornamental design. And then finally, actually some kinds of plants uh, can be patented if they're uh, uh, reproduced in a certain way. Uh, the process of getting a patent, uh, first of course you invent something. Uh, you write a patent application which describes your invention uh, in a way that somebody else could, you, could uh, make and practice the invention uh, and has some claims. Uh, you file that with the patent office and then you go into something called, we call patent prosecution. Uh, almost always the patent office will reject the patent application for some reason or other. And then there's this loop uh, that can happen where you go back and forth the patent office um, explaining we either think the examiner got it wrong, that the prior art doesn't show what he thought it did, or uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we should change the claims a little bit, claim slightly less of that 
boundary of property than, than we originally thought we would. Uh, and eventually, usually, we can agree with the patent office that you should get your patent. Uh, that process typically takes about three years, sometimes faster, sometimes quite a bit longer. Uh, a patent is good for about 20 years uh, from the time of filing with some minor adjustments if the patent office takes too long, but that doesn't have to count against you. Uh, one important thing that I always like to tell people who are considering patents is don't wait too long to file. Uh, any public disclosure or a sale or even an offer for sale of your invention will start a clock running. And in the US, you have one year to get your patent application on file. Otherwise, you will no longer be entitled to a patent. And the reason for that, although well, I've never heard anybody else explain it quite this way, the way I think of it is, uh, it goes back to the reason why the country has a patent law. Uh, the reason the country has a patent law is to get the invention disclosed and publicized and to teach other people how to exploit it. Well, if you've disclosed your invention and other people have been able to see it and start working on it, you've done that. There's no need to give you the patent in order to get you to do the disclosure. So uh, if, you're, if you're working on an invention, good idea to at least get a provisional patent application on file before uh, too much time goes by. And if you're thinking of patenting internationally, uh, it's even more important. Uh, there is no such thing as an international patent. You can't file one application and get a patent that covers many countries. Every country has its own patent office and own rules. But it is possible to file uh, what we call an international application. So most of the countries in the world have gotten together and said, well, let's simplify the process of applying for a patent uh, let's at least take the application and uh, do some preliminary looking patent searching on it, uh, get the results to the inventor, and then give him some time to decide if he wants to go ahead and pursue patents in individual countries, he can do that. Uh, that's called the Patent Cooperation Treaty. I can answer more questions about it later. It's kind of, kind of detailed. Uh, the important thing to remember about international patents is uh, that one year grace period that you get in the US after you've disclosed your invention doesn't exist in almost any other country. So you can just assume that once your invention is disclosed publicly you know, to somebody who's not under a non-disclosure or anything like that, you're probably not entitled to patents in foreign countries. There are many reasons you might want to file a patent application, and we talked a little bit about this in the property analogy. Uh, you might want to get a patent so that you could enforce it against somebody. Uh, yeah, you've probably seen that movie about the guy who got his patent and sued General Motors. That's the, that's the sword analogy. He used it offensively to uh, extract payment um, from somebody who was practicing his invention. Uh, a shield, uh, many large companies especially, will build a patent portfolio with the idea that if another practicing company wants to sue them, they'll have some ammunition to at least threaten to sue back. And what happens is many large companies have cross-license agreements where they just agree that, okay, we, won't, we just won't sue each other. Uh, a stick. Uh, it, having a patent portfolio can make your company a little more influential in uh, negotiations for, uh, uh, for licensing or, or uh, other issues in the company. And finally, uh, just the value of having a patent portfolio, especially for startup companies. This is important that uh, a buyer of your company is going to want to know, is your invention protected? Uh, is it going to be the case that I buy your company and then find out that everybody else in the world can make it and I can't do anything about it? Or do you have a patent where you at least have some leverage to stop that kind of thing? Uh, the cost of getting a patent, um, a provisional filing, uh, uh, we can usually do it at Kilpatrick Townsend for four to $8,000. Um, to file a complete utility or non-provisional patent application uh, the filing would be a little more than that, and then the prosecution uh, adds to the cost. Uh, 
I've heard estimates as much as 50 to 100 percent of the cost of filing uh, is, is what it winds up costing after all the prosecution. And then there are also something called maintenance fees, and this is the analogy to property taxes. Uh, once you get your patent, there are certain periodic fees that have to be paid in order to keep it uh, viable, to keep it in force. In uh, many countries, they're every year. In the U.S., they're every few years. But, uh, uh, but that's the one last piece of it. So that's a very, very quick overview of patents. Uh, appreciate your attention. And uh, do we have time for some questions? We do. Does anybody have questions for either Bill or David? question was, well, isn't a patent just the right to sue somebody, uh, which is extremely expensive, so is it really worthwhile to get your patent? And uh, it's a case-by-case -case analysis. If your product uh, is low volume, low cost, and will uh, never generate more than a few hundred thousand dollars of revenue total, then no, it would not be worth getting a patent uh, if, if you thought, if the idea was that you would be able to stop an infringer because the cost of, the, the cost of suing somebody is, you're right, very, very expensive. Hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars uh, to do that. Um, for bigger ideas, uh, for growing a company, uh, yeah, it, it can make sense to get a patent. Um, is this a variable device? The larger the temperature differential, the larger the power out. On uh, the same hardware, um, this unit at uh, 120 degrees differential is 3.6 watts, 140 degrees, it's 12.8 roughly. And um, I think at 160 it's uh, 18 watts. This device costs $50 for all the machining, only one, retail uh, components. This isn't brought to scale. And uh, if you look at uh, building 50 of these, you're down to about $4.70 per watt of electricity. The question is, is a patent always on something physical and tangible? Uh, there are method patents. Um, so there, there are four categories of, of uh, patentable subject matter listed in the statute. Machine, process, uh, mat uh, I can't even name them all. Uh, but there are such things as method patents. Uh, so, uh, no, it, there, there needs to be some connection with something physical, yes, but, uh, but it, doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be a machine that you're patenting. So the, the, the question was, what is reduction to practice that uh, you understand is a requirement for a patent application, and what are some ways to do that uh, other than building the actual device? Uh, so that is true, an, an invention is not an invention until it's reduced to practice. There are two parts, there's conception, there's having the idea, and there's reduction to practice. One way to reduce it to practice is an actual reduction to practice, where you build the machine and show that it works. And in the early 200 years ago, that was a requirement for a patent. You had to build a model and take it to the patent office. And, and the Smithsonian has racks and racks of these old patent models, and some patent attorneys collect them. And, uh, that's no longer a requirement. They basically ran out of space for them. Uh, but there's an alternative called constructive reduction to practice. And the, the <coughs> filing of a complete patent application is a constructive reduction to practice so long as it explains the invention in enough detail that someone of ordinary skill in the art can make and use the invention without undue experimentation. The question is, um, how, how much, uh, if I can paraphrase a little bit, uh, wouldn't it be easier to market your invention if you had built a, a working device than if you just had a computer model? And I think, yeah, the more you can do, the better. Um, I'm sure it would depend some on the invention. Uh, yeah, and, and I know at least three manufacturers and industrial designers in the room, and we use the model all the time to to show people the costs, and that's a, and graphic prototyping as well. It's actually, the cost has come down dramatically in the last decade. Uh, it used to be $20,000, $30,000 to get a simple little product made of plastic mold, and now it's 
just a couple thousand dollars, um, if that. Um, and architects are using those as well. Um, the 3D modeling and uh, 3D uh, printing. Um, actually, are we going to buy a 3D printing? We're looking at it. We're looking at it right now. So, uh, but, and Jeff, are you on one? Yes. Yeah, so we, that, that is a very, very common way. The cost is so low now. And I think that the Patent Office stopped taking models in the 30s, didn't they? I don't remember the date. But, but, I, but I mean, it's a, uh, it's a good argument for, um, it was all very, much more clear then, I think, mm -hmm. when we had models rather than just documents. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still, um, there are certain rare cases. If you claim that you've invented a perpetual motion machine, they're probably <laughs> going to want you to bring a model to the Patent Office. Right. <laughs> okay. I, Paraphrase this question too. Some of you may have heard that the Patent Office is establishing some satellite offices, and one of them is going to be in Denver. Uh, there's one in Detroit already. The Denver office has already picked out their space. They're hiring people. Uh, so the question is, how is that going to change the dynamic, especially for individual inventors? Um, I can tell you how I think it will affect how I do things, and I hope it would have some of the same effect for individual inventors. Uh, a part of the process, most of the process of getting a patent is this prosecution step, uh, the, the negotiating with the patent office. So we, we talk to the examiners quite a bit. I mean, they're, they're people that are interested in working out the best answer. Uh, having some patent examiners in Denver, uh, I'm really looking forward to being able to talk to them face to face. Uh, I think that will reduce the amount of time it will take to get a patent, which is uh, a, a real goal of everybody involved in the process. Uh, patents have, uh, it's just gotten to the point where it takes longer than it should. Uh, All right, is, is that good? Yeah. Sure. Okay, thank you so much for coming. We have made it 317 minutes without a cell phone ring, ring. I think that's fantastic. Um, please stop these guys at the door. Mr. Fry is in the back. He is the director and uh, CEO of the Vinci Institute. Um, if you'd like to speak with him. And uh, myself, Phil, and David will be at your meetings for the next couple of minutes. Have a great night. Thanks for coming.